As I mentioned before, there are those who sometimes will come afterwards and ask questions. And we had uh, such this past week. The question came from the discussion last week in regards to the brass serpent as to why would the serpent be what people would look towards as it was built by Moses in the uh, journey to the promised land. Because we also remember that the serpent was the antagonist to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And so why would that become a symbol I will tell you, I looked into some things, and I will say, first of all, there are those who feel that there's no relationship whatsoever. And that's a direction you can go in, and that makes it pretty simple. If we just say that the serpent in the Garden of Eden and the serpent on the brass pole were two different things. However, I'm also reminded something of the ministry of Arthur Oakman. Within our ordinances particularly, but within our Christian faith, we see that there are symbols. We have symbols placed before us this morning in the bread and wine. The bread symbolizing the broken body of Christ and the wine, his blood. And we see that tied into the sacrament prayers, and, and we've heard sermons on that and, and that kind of thing, and, and that's something that probably most believe and accept, but I'm not going to ever say that I know that all people, because I haven't talked to all people about it. And we also have before us another symbol, and that is the cross. And so we recognize the value of these symbols in understanding what the gospel is about. Now, Arthur Oakman stated that, and he was talking about the cross, but you could say the same thing about the, the bread and the wine, even the water of baptism when you go under that uh, the, we talk about the old uh, person uh, being washed and coming out as a new person out of the water. And we identify with those symbols and we see that the ordinances are filled with it. We, we have the symbol of the oil being the Holy Spirit for administration. The idea of the laying on of hands is a symbolic of the blessing placed upon the people in the various ordinances and sacraments of the church. But here's what Oakman referred to. He said, the cross and its value was changed at Calvary because it was taken before that as being a symbol of death a symbol of degradation. And what Arthur Oakman said is the Lord, in the act of going to the cross, turned the symbol of death into the symbol of salvation. And, and so within that, that also can find application in the view of the serpent is because the serpent came to deceive Adam and Eve, to which would eventually lead to their being removed from the garden. And now here, later in scripture, we find that the serpent is being used and raised up as being a symbol also of salvation. Now, if you're going to say, I'm not sure about that, then I will say that we, we, 
and that's okay. I don't think any of us have a full knowledge of understanding, but as I mentioned, uh, Arthur Oakman, the, the, his saying and talking about the cross has always stuck with me and has testified to me of the truthfulness of it. And so what happens is the Lord can take that which is not good and turn it into something of value. And at the same time, what happens is, is that we remember the cross was used for death and degradation. We don't lose sight of that. We don't forget that. We know what happened to Jesus and the, the thieves. We know what happened to others that went through that penalty. But we find hope because the Lord can take something in, in our lives that we would say, he'll never love me. He'll never accept me. He'll never allow me to enter into the kingdom of God. But what happens is the death of Christ changes the value of the cross. He has the power to change the value of our lives as well. And so it becomes a powerful message throughout the scriptures of the redemption of mankind. Now, I wanted this to kind of close off last week a little bit. We were studying whom do we worship? And I was reminded of some hymns. If you remember towards the end of the class, or the latter part of the class, I should say, I mentioned how we could, as the children of Israel did in starting to worship the brass serpent, we could begin to worship things and make them idols within the restoration. And I mentioned three areas, and that doesn't mean that these are bad things, but how we use them is important. And I mentioned in just reference of some things, is I mentioned branches, I mentioned priesthood, and even the symbols that we have, and I also mentioned our interpretation of scriptures. And so to undergird what I'm suggesting here is there are hymns that we sing and we may lose sight of what they mean and what the words are conveying. And one of those is a hymn that we've sung before I was born. It's been in our hymnals. And I want you to think about this as I read a little bit of the verse. We limit not the truth of God to our poor reach of mind. We have sung that all these years. Do we believe it? That maybe our poor reach of mind is that we do not fully understand the gospel, and so the idea of we limit not the truth of God is we consider the fact that God continues to speak, that there continues to be revelation, that light and truth continue to break forth, that as it says in Genesis, at the end there's going to be a flood of righteousness and truth that's going to sweep this world. And we believe that. That's, that's core to the restored gospel. By notions of our day and sect, crude, partial, and confined. And so what we find is that our understanding, in some ways, could be crude. And crude is being elementary, not crude like being crass. Partial, and as I mentioned last week, that if we are in contemplation and we think that someone's wrong, that person that's wrong could be me, 
because I realize that there is truth yet to break forth. So we go on. No, let a new and better hope within our hearts be stirred. The Lord hath yet more light and truth to break forth from his word. Ben Franklin, in 1787, was not initially in favor of the Constitution as it was written because the colony of Virginia had already had the Bill of Rights, and so that was not a new thing, and what he wanted was a Bill of Rights. If you'll remember, he, he passed away in 1790. In 1791, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are the Bill of Rights, and that was the sticking point for Thomas Jefferson as well. Thomas Jefferson was a Virginian, and so he was familiar with it, and you look at the first 10 amendments, and we say those are magnificent, but we're not on that class. But here's what Ben Franklin said when he stood at the Constitution. And this is going to be really rough because it's beautiful the way he phrases it. But what he said was that on that day, that there are things that he had questions about. But he did not put out of question that under new thought and new truth that he might find his way to change his mind. Now, that's a principle that was there in someone who we considered a, a great individual. It's a principle that was there in the restored gospel coming forth and we find that in the hymnal, so many things of significance. I heard Houston Hobart one time, and he was a senior president of 70. He made a comment about Apostle Charles Heald. And it was a service that the people had just sung, I love to tell the story. And Charles Heald got up and was the next speaker, and he said, when we sing that hymn, we are either a missionary or a hypocrite. Now, I highlight that because as we sing the hymns, we have sung, we limit not the truth of God to our poor reach of mind. And, and so consequently, within where we are as a people today, is there is more light and truth to break forth. I don't believe that it's going to take us in radical directions that, so, that all of a sudden we're going to be thinking something completely different, but what's going to happen is we're going to have a deeper, richer understanding of what it is that God is doing, what he has done, and what he will do in the future to bring about his kingdom here on earth. Now, that's where I wanted to go to kind of follow up last week. Now, I want to talk about the subject of restoration branches and how we view the branches. And although we could say, wow, you're gonna tread on some ground, you better be careful where you go. Let's go forward. I'm going to start with, if I was going to ask you what would be the best scripture to start with, you might have others in mind, but I would imagine that some of you would say, how about the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus proclaims himself, I am the true vine. And so I'm going to just read through the verses. If you want to go there, if you have your scriptures, since there are a few verses, not a large, none of the verses are very large, but I'm going to read from chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, starting with verse 1. And I want you to think about this in context of how we view a restoration branch. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me 
that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So if we begin to create an idol of a branch, just like King Hezekiah destroyed the brass serpent, the Lord is saying that he will take away that branch. And why is that? Is it because he's mean and nasty and he's vindictive and he's revengeful? Or is it the fact that the branch doesn't have the value that it needs to have because, as I referred to last week, and you're going to hear about it in the next session that we have, and so you're going to hear it today too, Section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith III, and I referred to the fact that Arthur Oakman said this is as meaningful of inspiration as any ever given. And what Joseph Smith III brought to the church in Section 128 is that we are to use the things of God in the manner designed of God. If I use something for my aggrandizement, if I use something that would cause pride, then it's not being used in the manner designed of God. So every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. As we go through this thing of branches, which is going to take probably two or maybe three Sundays, we're going to find that in the book of Revelations, that the Apostle John speaks to seven churches. Now, the churches there are not separate churches like denominations. They're of the same church. And what we find is, is that the Apostle John, by the Spirit, and we will see that because we're going to go through that, which will be on your sheet, is what we see the Spirit bringing to those churches is that there were some things that they were doing that weren't right. Now, as I said before, if you are thinking that somehow I'm making a comment about Living Hope Restoration Branch or Outreach Restoration Branch is not at all. And I don't want anybody to feel that if we talk about priesthood or we talk about shepherds and whatever, that it would refer directly to anyone in particular. Because the safeguard in the church, if I said is what, the safeguard in the church is the Lord has placed the responsibility on the people. That's why we are in a system of conferences whether a branch business meeting is really a branch conference. We have general conferences, we have general assemblies, and the people will have the opportunity to input. And so I want to make that clear as we proceed on. Uh, I'm in verse 2. He purgeth it that it might bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. So what happens is, a branch that does not abide in the vine, and what is the vine? The Lord says, I am the true vine, is not a branch that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what that means is for all of us, there is the possibility always of systemic apostasy. And what that means is we usually think of apostasy that somebody's going to do something that's really offensive in some way, that they're going to commit a personal sin. And that certainly can happen. But within the systemic sinning is that a body can also sin. And 
there are two things that as I've studied scripture that seem to be at the core of almost anything that would happen this way. One is pride, and Jesus laid that at the feet of the Pharisees in the Gospel of Luke, and the other is slothfulness. And so what happens is the five foolish virgins were slothful. The branch that no longer is of the vine can be prideful, can be slothful. And yes, we could make a list longer than that. But you're going to find at the core that those two things are very significant to where branches are. So let's continue to go on. And I read about abide in me, except abide in the vine, no more can you accept you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, I am in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And what happens to a branch that's cast forth? It withers. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now, here we go again. If you remember, uh, from the very beginning when we talked about the living church, talking about how the great commandments are run through the scriptures. I use the example of Jesus and Peter talking on the shore after Peter had come and they had had a meal together and Jesus asked the question to Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? As we see in that conversation, the two great commandments. So what does it say here? And I'm going to repeat, herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. And who is a disciple? As the father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, and you should go and bring forth fruit. If we want to say, well, what is the mission statement of a branch? We have a pretty good mission statement that's just been read. And a branch that does not center itself in these words is a branch that's going to not only struggle and in struggling will wither and withering will die because the branch is tied to the vine. In the book of Revelations, not to fast forward to what we're going to do there, but in the seven branches, the first one is the branch of Ephesus. And what does it say that the Lord has against them is that they have left their first love. 
Who is that? It's Jesus. What is the purpose of a branch? It is to be connected to the vine. And so when I mentioned systemic apostasy, is what happens is if we get separated from the Lord, then we have that danger of falling away. And we, the people, have the responsibility. A priesthood member that does not study the scriptures is acting slothfully. A member that does not pray unceasingly is acting slothfully. If we do those things that we have been asked to do, we can be that branch that can bring forth great fruit. But just because we call ourselves a restoration branch does not qualify for us to be his. Instead, there's something that's required of us. Okay, now let's go to the pages you have before you. And this is thoughts on restoration branches. Now, I'm going to just go through the first paragraph. The main part of this paper is I wanted to list items that restoration branches would really have difficulty in fulfilling. Because in our condition today, we are asking branches to do something oftentimes beyond what they're capable of doing. There are things we know individually that we are not capable of doing. And I will say, as the older I get, there's some things that I used to be able to do that I'm no longer uh, to do, at least not as well as I could do them before. So here's where you're going to come back to this idea of the message from Joseph Smith III. And so if you start on the thoughts on restoration branches, I'm going to read the first paragraph. The Lord has on several occasions made reference to branches in the scriptures. The purpose of this paper is not to question the legitimacy of having branches in the restoration, but take the words given to the church through Joseph Smith III and see if we are, quote, using the things of this world in the manner designed of God, Doctrine and Covenants 128, 8C. Among the scriptures we have on this subject, we find in Doctrine and Covenants 120, 1B through D, branches and their officers and districts and their officers are to be considered as provided for by law to carry on the work of the ministry and caring for the membership of the church. So branches are to bring a ministry of caring to the members of the church and to relieve the 12 and 70 from the vexation and anxiety of looking after local organizations when affected. And that would, of course, include even the missionary outreach of a branch. When branches and districts are organized, they should be so organized by direction of the conferences or by the personal presence and direction of the 12 or some member of the quorum who may be in charge if practicable. Or if a branch by the president of the district with the consent, knowledge, and direction of the missionary in charge when circumstances present the missionary in charge being present. And so that we see in that scripture, because I realize that's, if you're not really into church structure, that might seem like, boy, I, I have no idea what was just being talked about. What it's talking about is the nature of the branch is to be local primarily. As we've already talked about, has any branch, has Living Hope Branch been given the singular responsibility to bring about Zion? No. Has any branch, any singular branch, has Living Hope Restoration been, Branch been given the single responsibility to take the word to every nation, country, and tongue, and people? No. Not by itself. It is to be a part of the body. And that is the way it is 
with all branches. And so what happens is we're going to find that part of our struggle is we're trying to be something we have not been meant to be. You know, you might think you're talking about in terms of living hope. I'm talking about in Nairobi, or Kenya, or Tagum City, Philippines, or Zawadapeke, Honduras. I'm talking about every place we find the church. And so I mentioned a little bit then, and I do this, if it sounds prideful, I apologize. But I entered into branch leadership in 1976. And from that time on, have been involved in administrative matters of the church at various levels since then. You can read that. I don't need to do that to seem to try to make a case for me. I am not an authority. Jesus is the authority. And we'll just leave it at that because you already know that's the truth. Okay, so having said that, I've had some background in church administration at various levels of the church. In the RLDS church, we used to have a thing that had four levels of administration, and I worked at all four of them. As a seventy, I worked at the world church level. I worked at the regional council level. I worked at the district level as district president. I worked at the branch level as a pastor at different times. So I had a chance to see a bit about church administration. So now, I will break this down around two central thoughts as to why restoration branches exist and what are the limitations of restoration branches. Now you come down to where you see the numbers. So if you're thinking, I, I'm not sure where he is on that first page, that's where we are. I will tell you, when I felt directed to starting writing some things, I started by writing the things that are the limitations. But then the, the Spirit kind of said to me, you can't do just that because people will get the wrong impression that you're suggesting that there's not a value for restoration branches to exist. Branches are in the scriptures and they are very significant to the life of the church. Living hope is very significant to the work of the church and I don't want us to lose that. So I start by saying, okay, Lord, I'll write down some of the things without being totally inclusive. Let's put it this way. If I put down a hundred things and I started going through them, uh, you would have every right to just stand up and just walk out the room because it's going to be very laborious at that point. So what I did was, is on the 10 reasons to exist and the 10 limitations, is that I speak about some things for us to look at. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's go down the list. Why do restoration branches exist? Why does living hope exist? They exist because God created them in his church. We want to follow his pattern. It is a major accomplishment for restoration branches to still exist after 35 years since 1984, considering the obstacles that needed to be overcome. And what are the obstacles? Is that there are many priesthood offices consequently authorities that do not exist. Standing High Council, Council of Concordant Jurisdiction, and you'd say, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Why did I pick some of those things? It's because the fact is they've been non-existent for so long that they fall out of our discussion, and so we lose uh, sight of things that were missing within the church. Okay, number two, we became restoration branches in order to worship and fellowship as a people dedicated to doing the Lord's work. We see ourselves as heirs continuing the restoration work as it was restored and organized on April 6, 1830. Three, we desired to become free of a hierarchy that we believe departed from the word of God and the purposes for which the restored gospel came forth. We exercised our right as people. Okay, number four, we wanted to protect ourselves from those who would seek to control and teach doctrines in ways that we could not accept as the direction of the Lord. Number five, 
We desire to freely embrace and teach the scriptures as found in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants. We believe that all three books of scripture are historical and spiritual in nature, as opposed to being mythological or being a process theology viewpoint, suggesting that selected scriptures are outdated or could be considered disjunctive by current popular theological understanding now and in the future. Now, if you don't kind of get into those kind of discussions, you may say, okay, again, I don't understand what you're talking about here. Well, the idea is there are views of the scriptures as being historical and of spiritual practicality. There are views that would suggest and process theology kind of goes in this way where we continue to grow and develop and so some things get cast off. That as we grow, that there's some things that get left behind. And so it's, it's, a, it's a different perspective of the gospel. Number six, we want to share Jesus in the restored gospel. We are sent forth to invite people to Christ. We seek to practice the ordinances in the manner as has been done by those who have gone on before us in the church. The ordinances are considered to be holy and represent significant points in a person's life to seek blessing and guidance from the Lord and to be in his presence. The ordinances are sacred covenants between man, woman, and child with God and are central to one's life and worship of God. And this morning we have the sacrament of the Lord's Supper here before us of which we partake of and we do so gladly because of the significance it means to us in our relationship to the Lord. Number seven, we desire to raise our families in the gospel. Eight, we feel called to build up the center place for its great purpose. Number nine, the call of God is to take the word to all the nations believing Jesus will return soon. And number 10, assist in the building of Zion. And you'll see examples of that, and you can go back through that at any time. So what we have here is, again, that's not a full, comprehensive list. But it does give us some thought as to why the need for having a branch. We have come together for worship for study, for prayer, and for other things, fellowship. We come together for uh, breaking the word of God, but gain better understanding, become better equipped in our own lives, and together work on those things that a branch are to do and be supportive of being part of the body of Christ. Okay, so we go through this and I'm gonna switch all the way to the part. If you go through your paper, you're gonna find another list because I want us to hear this whole list before we break this morning. So what are the limitations of restoration branches? What is it that would cause us to struggle because it's beyond our capability and our capability because of the designs of God. All right, let's look at this list. The Lord did not set up the church with the branch as the highest organizational body. So what are we missing and what is the effect? We already read the scripture in John that the branch separated from the vine is going to wither and die. So we know the branch by itself does not have the ability to withstand or accomplish the, the overall major purposes. They have many significant purposes. They are to be the branches are to be the training grounds for our young people. Not the only training ground, but a training ground for our young people to develop. I grew up in the Haddonfield branch in New Jersey. And I will tell you, I still remember some things there that my Sunday school teacher taught. And that was my place to begin training. 
Okay, so what is it we're missing? And you know that always the danger in life is that sometimes we have problems because we don't know what we're lacking. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, uh, I do all these things, what is it that I yet lack? And so the Lord told him. Okay, number one, there is no higher executive legislator or judicial bodies in the church than the branch currently. That's not the design that the branch was to have. The Standing High Council is not a body within a branch. The Quorum of Twelve is not a body within the branch. The First Presidency is not a body in the branch. The Presidents of Seventy and the Seventy are not designed that way to be within the branch. Many questions fall to the branch to answer versus the leading quorums, orders, and councils of the church handling those matters in accordance with their scriptural authority. What happens when you have decisions that have to be made close to where the people reside is you don't have the buffer. Any pastor, and again, we're not talking about just living hope, any pastor, you are part of a branch. You are elected by the branch. And if you are sustained by the branch, you continue. But you have in that, that you're close to the people. And so sometimes it's hard to make decisions. I'll tell you, one of the first experiences I had as district president in Philadelphia, I was a pretty young man. I was invited into the district presidency when I was 28 years old. And the third largest branch in the church was having a business meeting. The district president asked me to come to the branch meeting because he was a member of that branch and he felt like he was too closely associated with them. So here I go in there. And you probably have seen some of these. This was a very contentious meeting. They were building a new church. And the pastor was being accused of the fact that they were cutting some corners and they were not doing things wisely. The branch president was besieged to the point where he looked at me and he said, would you take over this meeting? Now, the reason I told you I'm 28 years old and whatever is that, is that I had served as pastor of, of Woodbury Branch for three years. I had pastoral experience. But I'm thinking, my goodness, I'm being put right here in front of the people. You know, they were very respectful to me because I was able to be a buffer. That I had not been in any of the decisions that had been made thus far in terms of the building of the new church. And so the thing started to calm down because some of their ire was directed at someone personally. And then once someone who was not directly involved was now there, is they started to settle down. And we not only got through that meeting, but they built a beautiful church. Now, don't take that as anything as, as far as me go. I don't want to uh, state an example uh, and, and somehow look like the hero. I state it because the Lord put that process so that we would have buffers. But when we only function at branch level, the buffers that the Lord has provided are not there often. Maybe there's some, but many times they're not. So we find that that ability to have the higher executive, legislative, and judicial bodies in the church, the church suffers from that. Number two, priesthood and membership training are also inconsistent. At times, training does not exist at all. Therefore, the responsibility falls upon the branch firstly. The outcomes have been mixed, and I will tell you that Living Hope has taken it on responsibly for priesthood members. But if you remember, there was a gentleman who came here 
I'm not going to mention his name because you'd also then know his branch. And he had been ordained an elder in his branch, had then become the pastor. And he said to us, he said, do you know what my training was for becoming an elder? And so we're waiting for the, the tidbits of wisdom. He said, one elder said to me, when you're in the hospital administering to somebody, don't step on the cords. And there was nothing else that followed that. Now, that's not to make belittle him, or that's why I don't put the names in there. But what happens is when I say inconsistent, that's, a, that's an obvious example. Because when we function only as individual branches, independent branches, we will get different levels of training. Also, which would have to do with the capacity of that particular branch to do the training. So, we find that priesthood and membership training are inconsistent. Three, the teachings of the gospel may be different and thus inconsistent in some ways, either in the level of teaching or the content and viewpoint of the teaching. We left a body of people because we were concerned about a hierarchy. A hierarchy can form in a restoration branch as easily as it can form in a world church. Now, that's not pointing fingers at anybody. What I'm saying is, is that we don't have the safeguards in place. And so we have to really, and I'm not saying we as living hope, we as a restoration, we have to work very hard at dealing with those things. If relationships are mostly in the branch or in a narrow setting, the fellowship and interpersonal relationships will be of a more limited nature so that we can close off the rest of the restoration if we choose to do so. We can invite certain people in, we can invite certain people not to be here. Number five, the financial law taught and practiced by the branches make it more difficult to be consistent in teaching and practice. The idea of gathering the ties together is, is that how do we do the missionary work in the restoration? I can tell you it's not the same way as we did it within the reorganized church because we don't have the pieces in place. We don't have a presiding bishopric. We don't have a quorum of 12 and presence of 70 to organize and send forth the work. What happens is, is that it falls to branches. Now, being a 70, there have been those who have asked me and some things and what have you, but still, it doesn't have the consistent teaching and training. And the financial law would be the same way. I've been in enough restoration branches that I know that branches operate differently in terms of their finances. Branches operate differently in terms of their organizational structure. There are some branches that have bodies called elders council, which are not in all of the other branches. I'm not proposing any of that. What I'm just saying is, is that we don't function the same way. Number six, strong territorial boundaries could create pride. Who is the greatest? How do we measure the success of living hope? Do we measure it in relationship to another branch? Do we do it by how large we are? Or how many young people we have? Or whatever uh, teaching that we have that we feel is so uh, magnificent and, and great? How do we do that? And so what we find is that within these boundaries, we could fall to the same thing that tripped up the disciples in the upper room. The natural thing is that they were asking the question, Luke chapter 22, verse 23, they were asking and they had contention over who among them was the greatest. And so what we have is if we, if we have branches that operate independent, there is always the possibility that we could become prideful because somehow we think we're better 
bigger whatever. And we, again, is always referencing the restoration, not referencing this particular branch. I would say the same words I'm using today. In fact, I'm going to be teaching and outreach in a couple months. I would use the same words there. So I, I don't want you to focus on we being speaking of living hope. Number seven, because of our condition, a lack of enthusiasm may result. I'm going to read that paragraph. It becomes much harder to see the big picture when we're not hearing a great deal of the testimony and thought from a wider range of people. This, in turn, could lead to other conditions. Disinterest, loss of youth, and more because of being isolated from one another and being part of a smaller, more disconnected body. What did the Lord say through Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Can the hand say that it has no need of the feet? And when we proclaim ourselves to be independent branches, not only independent from the RLDS church, but independent from one another, we run into that. Number eight, poor communication may result by being separated and isolated. Many in the restoration do not know what is going on. The shepherds want to protect the flock. We see in Ezekiel 34, speaking in the last days, that there is a warning given to the shepherds in the latter days. The shepherds want to protect the flock. This is understandable. And I believe that everyone is trying to do the best that they know how. However, this can cause a firm control on who or what gets presented to the branch. This can be good by keeping out bad things, and there are some things that should be left outside of the branch that would be contentious. Or in some cases, not so good by keeping out good things, hearing testimony. And we, we have people come in here, so again, this is not directed straight the branch has been a help for the church to survive, but the branch as the leading organizational body is a solution for short-term benefit. At some time, the survivor mode has to be enlarged to be larger setting in order to survive long-term. How do we know this? The Lord talks about the gathering to the center place, and he talks about the word going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, as well as other larger things that are yet to come to pass. At no time, do we understand in scripture that all of this will come to pass through a singular branch? Zion is identified, number 10, by the Lord, more so than as a branch. Genesis 7:23, the Lord called his people Zion. Second Chronicles 7:14, if my people, which are called by my name, third Nephi, 186, or third chapter of first Nephi, excuse me. 186, 27, and blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion in that day. Doctrine and Covenants 145c. Zionic conditions are no further away nor any closer than the spiritual uh, conditions of my people justify. So what do we find in this, these scriptures? Is we find that the Lord speaks to the people. Sometimes there was references in the Doctrine and Covenants to specific branches, but most of the time, most of what we see in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants is addressed to a people. So here's where we are on this thing. So Jesus will come and reign as Lord, as the King of Zion. He will exceed branch president or even president and prophet of the church. Our branches are beautiful things and we praise the Lord for them. But let us not forget that they are set apart to contribute to the work and not the object and fullness of the work in and of themselves. And so what we're going to do is that uh, the next time we gather together is we're going to then take a more specific look at branches. Now, not specific into the name of the branches. That's not important for what I'm doing here. What is important though, is that we see how a restoration branch, a branch is to fit in to the vine and be part of the work. And if it is bringing forth fruit, 
it is of him. And if it is not, then it will wither and die. And so, brothers and sisters, that kind of sets the groundwork for where we're going to go. But that lays it out there before you. Thank you.